Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Dennis Wilburn, the Active Trend Trader. I am so excited today because guess what? We have two Can Slim guys, Can Slim aficionados. We have Bobby Campos and Steve uh, Macri. I've been watching them on YouTube. I've been watching them just spout out about how great uh, Can Slim is. And of course, if you don't know what Can Slim is and you really need to watch this, all the way through the end because they're going to share some tips, secrets, way to get started trading for stocks. At the same time, they're going to tell you to show you some pitfalls that you should want to avoid. But at the same time, they're going to tell us their story of how they basically uh, matched up, the teamed up to do their YouTube uh, uh, presentation called our YouTube channel called Discipline Mind Traders. Uh, I first ran into the both of them. Um, on, on Instagram, actually, I think. And I just reached out and started chatting with them back and forth. And we got to talking about Can Slim because I'm a Can Slim guy too. Now I do tweak it a little bit because I'm also a traditional technical analyst kind of guys. Those of you who know me, you know that's the way I roll. However, uh, people who apply the Can Slim method really apply it, uh, uh, basically beat the market almost every year. The back testing I've done on the IBD 50 and, and some, well, at least Steve remembers the IBD 100 yes. <laughs> back in the day. Um, I remember getting the paper every day. <laughs> oh yeah, getting that paper every day, you know, and it would follow, you know, because when I first started subscribing to I was still in the Navy and it would follow me around from duty station to duty station. And the only problem is, is my wife would get so ticked off at me because I'd have a stack of IBD 50s in the corner <laughs> that would grow and grow and grow. And so, and so there have been some improvements made. But uh, anyway, I, what we're going to do today in today's session is just, I want, I'm going to be basically asking some questions, but I'm going to turn it over to both, you know, Bobby and Steve. And I'm going to ask the question, let them approach it from, you know, from however they want to approach it. Because, uh, like I said, I like what they do. I like what they present. And if you have not followed them on YouTube, please go over there. And as we say, subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified when they post new stuff. So right out of the gate, guys, how often do you post new stuff? We post uh, three times a week. So we do uh, two videos over the weekend, which is uh, the weekly uh, quick wrap, which is our market recap. Right. Uh, and then we do... Um, and actually, we just started adding just a little fun episode after about ourselves. And then we do uh, a chart breakdown, which is normally around on Mondays. And then a trader talk, which is just discussion topic we think could help traders improve their trading. And that's every Wednesday. So, and then, and so before we get started with that, I have to ask Bobby one question, Steve. And you, you, can, you can vouch for him telling us the truth on this one or not. Is one, as getting married helped or hurt your trading? <laughs> uh so far it, it's helped so far it's okay. helped you know a lot less a lot less going on in our lives a little more calm down so it's helped and uh yeah i mean because you know, uh your wife seems like a very lovely young lady and all that kind of stuff oh uh, she's a she's a saint the amount steve can vouch for her the amount of stuff that she puts up with that's saint's the only word that could be used when they say <laughs> people married marry up bobby married up <laughs> yeah 100 well, percent that's what all my art, my relatives in Arkansas tell me. They they go, you know what? You clearly married way above yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's for any guy. That's the key. Mm -hmm. It is. Yep. So let's go ahead and kick off. And uh, uh, one, I want to ask um, one: What gets you started in trading? I know you you run on different track records, but your track records have intersected. So now you're kind of sojourning together. Uh, and spreading the word. I mean, you guys are, you know, you talk about spreading the gospel of Can Slim. You know you're doing that. So, uh, Steve, I'm going to start with you. What got you started in trading? Uh, I know we have a similar story, yeah. <laughs> a little bit, but go ahead, just, just briefly. Sure. What got you started and, and, and got you to Can Slim? Yeah, I was a finance major in college. So while I was at Ithaca College in upstate New York, I started, it, it got my juices flowing in stocks. So I guess somewhere in being a finance major, we subscribed to Business Week, the Wall Street Journal, and I started reading those. What really got me started and interested in stocks was I worked doing pools in the summer. 
So my friend had this pool business that was exploding. And during that time, I made so much money. I was probably making about $1,000 a week back in the late 80s, early 90s. So I had so much money, you know, I'd, every day I'd buy lunch for my guys and everything else. So I ended up beginning to invest in stocks. First, my dad told me, oh, just buy Citibank because we're here in New York. That's a good stock. Somehow, some way, my father, who now embarrassed, I look back on that. I'm like, I can't believe I took advice from this guy because he knows <laughs> literally nothing. If I could start telling you stories, I love my father to death, but he knows nothing about stocks. That I took advice and I made 25% on my first, very, very, very first trade. I, and that's, and you know this, Dennis, net of hundred plus dollar in and out. I still made 25% because guys like Bobby and, and all these, uh, what, what, what's that thing called? Uh, the, the, the trading uh, Robinhood app where, Robin, yeah. where it charges you nothing to, uh, to trade. I still netted, you know, 25% gain. So then from there, I had an uncle Lou who was an options trader and he was an IBD subscriber. So he saw me one day reading the Wall Street Journal and he's like, no, 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 that, that thing stinks. <laughs> Read this. So I started reading IBD and it made sense to me. So then I, it was around the, I remember exactly when it was actually, it was my winter break of 1990. So yeah. it was the winter of 1989 going into 1990. I, I read how to make yet. money in stocks. What'd you say? I said, I wasn't even born yet. I know. <laughs> And I read the book, I, I'd say I read it twice. I read it once and then I, I took notes on the second way, way through. <clears throat> and that's where uh, our paths intersect. And the first stock I bought, CanSlim, was Software Toolworks. So what I did, and I'll tell you how I found it. I literally took a green um, account, accounting pad, what I don't know, ledger pad, and I literally wrote down every single stock that was in 99.99. Mm -hmm. And software tool work somehow. And I think I got actually at that time, I got a, um, like a, uh, what do you call, a uh, partial subscription to daily graphs, like a, a introductory offer to daily graphs. Yeah. And I went through that and software tool works had the best chart. Everything about it was, was perfect. And this was probably the, the only time in the, the first four or five years of my trading, I followed the rules to the T. So Dennis, I, I mean, you know what software, what software tool works did. It was a model book stock and I, I put $3,000 in it. Then my uncle, the options trader started telling me you have $3,000 or five. I can't remember. I think I had three or $5,000 somewhere around there. And he's like, you know, you're allowed to margin that. So you could, if you buy a hundred shares, you could buy 200 shares. So I'm like, really? really? So, <laughs> yeah. So I bought 200 shares. And then once I started getting even more margin, I ended up, I, I think I ended up with like 350 shares. So I literally did what the most aggressive trader in the whole entire world would do. And I just kept on, every time I kept on having more equity in my portfolio, I just kept on leveraging it up and, 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 and amping, amping that up. So that was my first cancel trade. And on the backs of that, the second cancel trade is a stock I think everybody's heard about was Home Depot. But this was in Home Depot. You remember Home Depot back in the 90s around that time. It made, not only did it make me, but it made, I made all my friends so much money in Home Depot. They thought I was, they all thought I was going to become, you know, a billionaire. I keep telling right. everyone this. Thing. They thought I was the smartest person in the world. Not only did my friends make money, but all their parents made money because at that time, I think it was their 60th store opened on Long Island and everybody started going there. So right. when everyone heard that we were making money in this, everybody just started piling in. And I, on that trade, I made about 130%. On software tours, I was up over 200%. And then it pulled back to 150%. And I think you heard the story before, if you watch our podcast. When I sold software, software to works, even though I did on Home Depot, I started crying because I thought I'd never, like I was, I wasn't like hysterical crying. I was like, I, I literally was like tearing because I didn't think I'd ever find another stock that would do that again. Right, right. So you can tell I'm a real believer in capitalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it kind of reminds me of what my mentor, mentor used to tell me because I'd get so impatient about finding new stocks. He'd say, Dennis, be patient. He goes, the best trade of the year comes around about every two weeks. Yep. That's so <laughs> yeah. true. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So you did the first two trades perfectly. Then what happened? Then I bought Microsoft that summer. And if you remember, that was the summer of the uh, Persian Gulf crisis. Yep. And 
being the genius, I was on margin then as well. And I sold exactly, exactly at the bottom. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, yep. but luckily a month later, I bought Cisco Systems. Yeah. So that was, that was probably the biggest trade I made in the 90s. I yeah. made a ton of money on Cisco Systems. It, I, I actually think I bought it at the actual model book breakout in 1990. It was cool. ridiculous. I mean, that was another, and, and again, because having my having my unique skill of, of margin, I margined that up too. And I did really, I mean, I probably with software tool works and Home Depot in college. So let's say that $5,000 became about, I want to say between 12 and $15,000. So at that time, a college student, it was ridiculous. Oh, yeah. 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 I ended up, I don't remember where it ended up going down with Microsoft and then Cisco systems and buying that. But I do remember about a year later, I was probably up to got my portfolio up to over $50,000. Okay. And then this is where the story gets sad. So I, you know, was Mr. Canslim. I did everything. I was doing everything well. So clearly I, I, on, on Cisco systems, that was another perfect Canslim stock too. From there, I started hearing these whispers from all over the universe. I started watching at that time, FNN, I don't even know if it was, I, I don't know if it had merged with C, uh, CNBC yet, but right. I was watching FNN because there were more um, IBD people on there than there were on uh, CNBC. And I started watching CNBC and I began to think that was the reality of what investing is. And right. I started, and I love Warren Buffett. I'm not gonna, I will never pull back from that statement. I truly think he is a stellar businessman, but, I, I don't, if he has the hardest model to, to trade and I, I would never recommend anyone trading. It. And I want to do a video on it because it, it's probably the most, just like all the information we're getting on the coronavirus. I think all the, there's so much misinformation about Warren Buffett, great businessman. You're not going to duplicate his results because there's a lot of reasons why, right. but I didn't know that. And everybody was touting how great he was because he was the, the killer investor. He was the Elon Musk at that time. I don't know if you remember that. Yep. And, um, so I started getting into value investing. And from that point on, I started thinking, okay, I didn't realize the pure form of canceling, how well it works and how terrific it is that like I started to, to take other pieces of other investment styles and mix them in. Yeah. And admittedly, the biggest mistake I made, and I, I say this all the time, the one thing that I ignored, and I wish we had YouTube at the time, I wish I had the resources that are available today, I would ignore the market. And I don't know if you remember this, Dennis, a lot of times around that time <clears throat> in the nineties, they would always be market uh, uptrend under pressure, uptrend under pressure, and the market would yep. still be moving up or it would, or it would flip into a correction. And then quickly, it's kind of sort of like right now, believe it or not, right. how like people, People right now could get worn out by a market correction and people are going to, I know this is going to happen to some investors. They're not going to believe that the market's really in a correction at the worst point, because that's exactly what happened to me. I would ignore, I'm like, this doesn't work. They, they, you know, everything else is great. They understand earnings. They understand this. So it should be can slow, you know, and I was trying to, to make up my own acronym and it doesn't work. There's, right. It's cancel for a reason. And that's, that's, you know, probably through the rest of the nineties, you know, I hit on some other big stocks. I, I, um, I, I bought Cisco a bunch of times. I bought um, uh, uh, Sun Microsystems. I bought, I, I mean, I was in, in and out of a lot of things, but I, I had media, I'll, I'll, I'll be completely honest, probably for the next 10 to 15 years, I had mediocre results. A lot of it was, I was making, I was doing well at my job. Um, right. And I, I then started to begin to, to change somewhere around 2006 or seven, I began to say, you know what? I find a lot of stocks through canceling, but I'm not actually following through and doing the things that I used to do. And I know I had good results with it. Right. So at that point I started going back to the, uh, actually I didn't tell you this story. In 1990, I had met Bill O'Neill and I told him, I bought Cisco systems and he patted me on the shoulder and he goes, you're well on your way, young man. You're going to do really well. And in fact, I didn't, I don't think I've ever told you this, Bobby. I actually yeah, went, I out saying, to I heard this. I went out to California and I applied to Dale, to, to uh, IBD. I had a job interview with IBD and they basically told me get lost. I, 
<laughs> I was such a loser. I, if, if, if that were me now, I would have applied like 50 times. Uh, and I just would have just kept going back there every day. I would, probably would have pulled a George Costanza and just went in there and said, listen, just give me, give me work to do. I swear to God, I, I, the way I am now, yeah. I've done that. Yeah. So, so I, I um, realized the mistakes that I made. And I st- so I, I went back to another um, uh, seminar in, in the city. And that started getting me going again. I then went up to Boston uh, and went, I went to a level two. I went to, a, I wish I, I, someone in IBD probably knows this date. It was August of 2008. And I, I swear it saved my ass. Because at that point I realized, and this is a huge, huge switch. And this is great for any listener. It was the first time someone told me to stop using daily graphs and start using weekly graphs. And it was a massive change. Yeah. yeah. Um, although I probably had a, a, like three weeks to, you know, implement that. But the one good thing it did, it got me out of a lot of, lot of stocks right as the market were correcting. Like when the market corrected, I want to say it was September like 3rd or 7th, somewhere in the first week of September. I started just cutting, 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 cutting. Right. Um, and then from there, uh, I'm not going to lie. I owned coming out of the 2009 bottom. When you hear this, you're going to die. I owned <laughs> almost, I think 60% of my portfolio was to Apple. I was so confident. So I doubled my money. I, I bought it like uh, maybe a little less than double money. I bought it somewhere between 75 to 95. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was below 100. And I traded beyond, I think I like the 160, 170. Right. And, th- and then this was the stupidest thing I ever did in my life. One of my friends who's a trader, uh, and he made like 300% because he was short everything in 2008, told me to buy a biotech stock. <laughs> and yeah. I, sold, I sold my Apple to buy a biotech stock. And it, actually, actually, at first it wasn't bad. The stock was up 400%. And then this is the great part of my story. Uh, it, I went out to lunch and the stock was trading at like $3. The next thing I know, I get back from lunch. It was trading at a buck 25. It didn't get an approval from the FDA. Yep. Yep. And, yeah, and then after that, I was like, okay, I'm done listening to anyone else. And yep. that's when and I really that. started to get to, to be a pure, pure, pure canceling trader. Okay, cool. A little long winded, but. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that, that is so. So you now, just now, and then we're going to jump over to Bobby. So you now specifically just stick with the can slim methodology. Yes. Okay, because I'm going to come back to that a little bit because I'm going to ask you what triggers you into your trades for sure. both of you. But let's go over to, 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 to Bobby. Okay, Bobby, you've been trading for approximately four years. Yeah, just uh, just over four years. It was, see, it was probably right about the time when you started really uh, – getting back into canceling again, right? Yeah, we probably met, I want to say 2000, somewhere between 2011 and 2013. Yeah. Uh, But I mean, for me, I was just one of those people that I guess, you know, family and myths of the market were kind of embedded in my head. I thought market was rigged, stocks were rigged. Mm -hmm. You only made money on Wall Street. I just had a poor image of trading in general on top of the fact that Mm -hmm. I I was a horrible, not a horrible, but I wasn't a great uh, student especially in math, um, had no interest in finance or anything like that. So for me, stocks were just never even a thought. Uh, but I was an IT recruiter. And a lot of my clients, like uh, I guess any kind of uh, job that you have, people are always talking stocks, always talking the market. Um, yeah. And I just, I got to the point where sitting down with a client and they start talking stocks, I just felt like I had nothing to add to the conversation. So one of the guys that I worked out with, uh, my friend Keith, had uh, introduced me to Steve. Steve was always the guy that was uh, walking on the treadmill, uh, which I didn't know at the time reading the IBD paper. <laughs> yeah. And I knew he traded stocks. Multitasking. Yes. I'm multitasking. You, that's, what, that's what I would read my IBD and no joke. Every, every single day. Yeah. Every single day. It was that and your iPad. You were always sitting there. Yeah. And um, so I was talking to Keith and he said, you know, just, just ask Steve, he'll help you out. So I said, Steve, I want to kind of just start to understand some stocks, stocks so I don't sound like an idiot in front of my clients and, and coworkers. So that's when he handed me Matthew Galgani's uh, How to Make Money in Stocks, Getting Started. Yep. He said, here, read this book, cool. come back to me and let me know what you think. And just left it at that. So I pick up this book and I start reading 
uh, in the middle of the summer of 2017. And, and in my head, I'm like, all right, I'm going to just get some like basic knowledge and you know, that'll be it. And I read the book and I, I must've got through maybe the first 10 pages. And I said, Oh my God, everything that I thought I about the market, this is saying that it's all wrong. And it just, I don't know exactly what jumped out at me, but it just, it seemed possible. It seemed like something that I could do. And I was just instantly hooked. So next time I saw Steve, I said, I finished the book. Can you help me out? Can you teach me a trade? Well, you also knew, you also knew me. So you knew that it didn't take much for smart people. You don't have to be too smart. To I saw the, ba- I saw the this baseline. Guy's an idiot. This guy could do it. I can do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's really funny you say that because, you know, I, I work with a lot of silicone. What, that I'm an idiot? No, 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 no. I work with a lot of Silicon Valley engineers, right? Yeah. Now, engineers tend to have a little bit of an ivory tower syndrome. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're uh, uh, um, over, over-educated. And, and Overthinkers. Over, yeah, over-educated. They want to reinvent the wheel. They basically um, are in, in a lot of cases, like my dad used to say, they're educated past their intelligence. Um, and so... <laughs> And and I can say that because I am an engineer, so I mean you know I, I know the I know the breed, um, but the fact of the matter is is that what I tell people is I said well you know normally it's going to take you two to three years to learn how to trade, unless you're an engineer then it's going to take you five to ten years. <laughs> I mean and I mean that all in all sincerity because a lot of times they can't get out of their own way uh, to just accept. There's a clear and simple way to do this. You know, Bill and Neil's approach just absolutely is phenomenal. So, Bobby, go ahead. Back to you. Well, it's funny <laughs> now, that you say now that we've trashed the, now that we've well, trashed the engineers out there. <laughs> I got a couple of friends who are engineers. I'm gonna have to make sure they watch this too. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it's funny that you say that too about canceling because I think one of my biggest advantages that I actually had was canceling was the first my first introduction to anything trading. So. Right. I was just so committed to cancel him and I had none of the other, like Steve was talking about, um, you know, all the other noise that's out there. I had none of that. Um, so I think my mind was less cluttered and it just made it easier for me to kind of accept what was going on and just kind of go full, uh, full on in on cancel him. Um, but, uh, similar to Steve, I had some success, not as big success as Steve did. What were your second and third books? Oh, so then, um, the next book was, uh, Nicholas Darvis, how to make money in stock, uh, not how to make money in stocks, how I made $2 million in the stock market. Right. So I read that book, uh, enjoyed that. And then the next book was the orange book, the cancel Bible, how to make money in stocks. Yes. Um, you got it right there. I have it behind me too. <laughs> That's one of those that you keep readily available, right? This yep. book. Yep. That one right there. Uh, this while book. this was, yep. And that was the first one that I read. And here's a pretty, this is also a pretty good book. Yeah, right? that's the one you're in. Yeah, I was going to say, that's definitely <laughs> that's a, great a good book one. Too. It's actually funny when we're talking talking about that. I was like, I can't believe I never had you uh, read that book because I love Amy Smith's book. It, it gives you like the uh, optimism that people can do this. And I think it's oh, yeah. an amazing Without book as well. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'm in a little itty bitty part of it. You know, I got to stop. But the thing that I love that Bill O'Neill says about the people in that book, he says that uh, we can help people identify the best 2%. Of the stocks in the market, that's 100%. a pretty high, you know, pretty high deal. So, Bobby, go go, go ahead. Um, so, with uh, my first trade, uh, it was actually Square, which I had bought right out of a breakout. Ended up having about 75 80 percent gain out of that. So, my confidence was up right off the bat. And then on top of that, so uh, with a lot of the guys from the gym, we used to go to uh, Texas Roadhouse every single Wednesday. They had a, uh, it was 11.99 sirloin and two side deal that we used to go to every, like every couple of Wednesdays. 12 ounce, 12 ounce sirloin. 12 mm. ounce, yes. <laughs> so we, we'd go there a lot just to hang out with a lot of the guys from the gym. And Steve said, all right, if, if you're learning to trade, we'll go there every single Wednesday for the deal. Bring your books, bring any questions you have, and we'll go through everything and I'll help you learn. Uh, so that helped me out a lot too, because I actually had somebody to kind of rely on. Right on, um, right on. And I think that's kind of where, and I'm sure uh, we'll get into this a little further, just kind of where our podcast, why we, why we're doing it. It's kind of because I had what, what Steve gave to me, we want to give to other people too, but I love that. So uh, right after that, I uh, ended up leaving the IT recruiting job because I did get called for air traffic control training. And for anybody who knows, you go to Oklahoma city for four months, it is a pass fail with about a 50% pass rate. So 
pretty much uh, as stressful as people think the job is to kind of just be away from home in the middle of nowhere, trying to fight for your career and pass. And I decided luckily that I was going to trade very lightly. I would not put too much time into trading because I knew I just didn't have the time. Right. So I kind of breezed through those months pretty good. But when I came back, I guess I was riding this high of, I passed, I'm an air traffic controller, but then at the same time, I'm like, okay, I could start trading again. And I was just not doing the work whatsoever. I was cutting mm-hmm. corners in all my routines. I wasn't really just buckling down and my trading really, really suffered to the point where I had, I forget the number exactly, but somewhere around like a 40% drawdown uh, over the next, I think it was like six or seven months. Yeah. And that was a huge, huge wake up call for me because I was, I had that confidence from the beginning, a couple of months of my trading. And once I kind of experienced that it's, this isn't just anybody can do it. You do have to do the work. It's just not that easy. Um, so that was my wake up call. And, uh, I kind of revamped my system, started seeing more success. And, uh, last year was probably, uh, one of the best years that I've had, uh, beat the S and P was pretty much pretty close to in line with the NASDAQ and, uh, felt like I was executing cancel and kind of just like Steve was saying, when you execute it perfectly, you see the results. Okay. Um, so that's kind of just like my journey through cancel. The, uh, you guys mentioned a couple of, <clears throat> I will. Uh, so I like to, to characterize some of those things where you're not utilizing, not following your routine, not following your rules. And then tends to, t- bad things tend to happen when you do that. Right. And I kind of call that operator error and, and literally the, and it's, and also depending on the psychology or mindset you bring into the game also, because I mean, we, and I know I had lots of crappy baggage that I carried with me that I still, you know, at 69 years old, I still have to be on guard that that stuff doesn't, you know, stick its ugly head up, you know, and, and, and cause me to self-sabotage, uh, believe it or not, but it, that is the truth. But, uh, the, the, uh, I, I got, you know, a couple of, here's where I'm going to go with this is one, Bobby, you mentioned you had false perceptions about the market. Steve, I don't yes. know if you had the, the same, you know, same false perceptions about the market. No, no, I was a finance major. So I, I basically, <laughs> my perceptions where you can make a lot of money. If yeah. you need false perceptions about canceling a million percent, that, yeah. I mean, goes, yeah. Yeah. I, this is my college. My college school, college education was discounting cash flow models and, okay. and, and, and crazy stuff. It was like the complete opposite of what we do. So, because uh, one of the things I've noticed is that with the members of the active trend trading, you know, family, the the ones that tend to do at least gra- gravitate and, and jump on board faster are the ones who have a healthy attitude about money. They recognize that money is a tool. It is not a, 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 but those who had, for whatever reason, an unhealthy attitude about money, because let me tell you, you start trading real money, uh, emotions kick in that you may never have dealt with before. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> then you're going, ah! and you know, you, the pucker factor, you know, uh, kicks in, you go, ah! and you need know, pucker all over your other, very, very, <laughs> other places in your body too. Um, but what okay in you're dealing with other people that long verbose uh, lead in was basically what lies do you think majority of people believe about the market that keeps them from basically becoming a student of the market or stands in the way of their success if they are trying to learn how to trade what lies from, from, um, from my perspective, I think the biggest thing is it, it's, it's, on, it's almost two sides of the coin. You have one group of people who just thinks the entire market's rigged. Nobody makes money. It's all set up and the little guy always loses. Uh, so that's like the one side of the coin. And then you have the opposite side of the coin, which is the people that think it's super easy. Just look at companies that are out there like uh, that, you know, that look good put some money in there, forget about it and watch the market go up. And like the last year, it seemed like that side of the coin was probably more predominant because of just how, how great the market was last year. But I think that's kind of the two sides that I see that prevent people from actually attempting to learn the market. Either they think it's so easy and anybody could do it. So why do I have to put effort into it? 
Okay. Or they think it's impossible. So why do I have to put effort into it kind of thing? Okay. So kind of like along the line of what uh, uh, Mark Minabini talks about and Mark Douglas also talked about it, the ease of entry for some people, the ease of entry into the market is just too easy. And, yeah. and, and, and they don't recognize that the mastery part of it takes both. Uh, you guys covered it in your, your, your webinar earlier today. You have to learn, you have to absorb, you have to execute you have to experience the system and follow the rules. See, yeah. I, took, I took notes on you guys. You know that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. And so what about you, Steve? What, what kind of lies are people believing? I think the biggest lie that people tell themselves is that they can't do it. Mm. And I personally think this, and this is just from my experience. I think they let fear and outside influences dictate their trading and they don't, right? This is easy. They don't believe in the system. I think that's a lie. Mm. I think if you heard my story, like, it, and it, the same thing happened to Bobby. And, and I guess you're saying that, you know, the same thing about yourself, Dennis, when you start making excuses and lies, and, and we talked about it before the podcast, all excuses are lies. It's really important to understand that. And the second thing is, and I don't know if we're going to get into this topic, you really analyze that once you do, you know, you do your re review your trades and you really do that. And that's where you see the truth of what's going on and that you have to detach. There's like a detachment that you need from the rest of the world. And it's, it's, it's you battling yourself. Like, I don't like, this is going to sound crazy. I don't like to, to actually in my head when I'm trading, I don't want to think about the S&P 500. I don't want to think about any average. I don't want to think about anything other than actually doing the trade. And when you begin to clutter, because you were kind of saying it about with the engineers, when you get too much information, it begins to clutter your mind. And that's where you begin to have self-doubt. You begin to th overthink things. And this is way more simpler. It's just eliminating those externalities from entering into the trade in the system. I don't even know if I answered the question right. Well, I, I, I might be able to tie it in because it's almost funny because what you're talking about, that fear, it kind of manifests itself in two different ways. You know, either manifest the fear manifests in I can't do this or it's impossible or it's rigged or saying like, I'm not going to try. This is so easy so that if you do fail, it's well, I didn't really even try. I just, you know, I just threw a couple of money at some stocks. So whatever happened, happened. You know, it's yeah. funny because I'm a recruiter and I, and I always talk about expectations to my um, candidates and clients, when you place a candidate and the client thinks they're up here, but yet the candidate's here, or the candidate goes into a company thinking it's here and the company's really here, you're going to have a terrible placement. And everything is about the expectations in your mind of what you, first of all, what you can get out of the market, what you, the expectation is of what you're going to be doing. And, 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 and thinking too, and all, it, it's a really hard question what you asked this. I, I could go on, I'll be honest with you, I could go on for an hour about this. No, we're not gonna let you do that. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm along with it anyway. I got, but, I got yeah. Dennis for backup on this episode. Yeah. You ain't gonna let that happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, there's just a lot of a lies that you can tell yourself. And it's uh, like you were saying before, it, it, it's, it's all about your mindset and just being as simple and, and just humble as possible and just doing the system. Right on. No, I agree with that. Whole you know, and when did you guys make, okay, one, you both of you talk about process and systems. One of the things that I always uh, uh, harp on and basically when people get started trading, they, they get enthralled or they get attracted lustfully, for lack of a better term, towards the strategies. They want to trade. They want to trade options because it's sexy. They can make a lot of money. Blah 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 blah. But the fact of it is, is they go into that looking to trade the strategy without a system, and it's a train wreck looking for a place to happen. And uh, you know, I've shared many times a story about a good friend of mine called me up one day and says he was trading iron kind doors, where you know you pick up like ten cents on both sides of the on the both sides of the the wings. And it went against him and he was down five figures in his, yeah, in, five figures was what he was down. And I said, man, I said, you really need to cut your losses here. He goes, well, I don't know. I go, you got earnings coming up, you know, don't hang on to this one, cut them now. And uh, so I go, at least cut some of them, you know, cut it in half, whatever. 
And uh, he didn't listen. And I don't give advice. I help coach and train people. That's what I do. He didn't listen to me. And, and I get the call the next day. His five figures slipped to six and he dropped it. And let me tell you, when you're in your 60s and you do something dumbass like that, excuse me, but that's what it was. Is 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 you know it's it, it it's devastating because it's now yeah. taken him, uh, he's in his seventies now, and it's taken him that long to build it back up. Thank God he has. Yep. But uh, anyway, I get I get emotional when I. But that's one of the things that I see uh, from just mistakes people make. Uh, do you guys ever trade? Um, you trade. You primarily focus on stocks, right? Do you ever trade? ET, if you well, do you ever trade ETFs like the index ETFs and or certain sector ETFs? Yes, I I personally don't. I haven't really started to dabble in that space. The, the only one I did was I did uh, a little bit of the Bitcoin ETF as like a, a kind of trend following type of trade. Yeah. Um, but no, personally, I I, I don't really. And which uh, so which Bitcoin ETF was it? Uh, Grayscale. Um, okay. I forget the ticker off the top GBTC. of my head. Yeah, I was going to say. So what about you, Steve? Same, well, he, I think he probably traded that because I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> I got influenced. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't really trade it often, uh, but I have been. Um, actually, I did the Bitcoin this year and I actually about um, maybe three weeks ago, I bought the triple Qs when it broke out yeah, recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know exactly when it, I, I don't know the date. And then I also track some of the commodities. I'm starting to do that just purely, purely from trend following, just from the uh, yeah. chart analysis that we do. Yeah. So no, that's good because yeah, I like to trade the uh, three three uh, ETS primarily. I like the TQQQs or the SQQQ on the right. upside side, and and of course I like TNA because who doesn't like TNA, right? right. <laughs> anyway, but that's another uh, topic we can talk about later. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. <laughs> So um, I know, who do you go to for inspiration? I know we've talked a little bit about the, the Jocko. You like Jocko. Yep. But the, the, that's the other thing that I really like about you guys is because the, peop, the people, the men typically that you go to for inspiration are, are straight shooters, no BS, no beating around the bush, they're not sitting there worrying about whether they're going to offend somebody. They call it the way it is and they, so uh, to help you toe the line. So how does that help you as a trader by, by you know, going to those guys for inspiration? Immensely. I'll answer this real quick. Above all, you're, you're going to be so surprised by this, Dennis, because we don't talk about them enough. Our favorite mindset inspiration is John Wooden. Yeah, well, you know, it's a very good point. We don't talk about that enough. Yeah. Right he has the greatest, I, I, I say this, I gave Bobby actually the book before I ever gave him the cancel book. And I, I truly mean this. John Wooden is the greatest American philosopher. People do not understand. You want to talk about simplicity. You want to talk about doing everything right. This guy personifies it. In fact, Bill O'Neill talks about him a lot. Yeah. And, and you'd be, uh, Bill O'Neill does, uh, Bill Belichick, some of the greatest minds of our time because of the simplicity of what he does. To me, he does cancel and coaching is how I view it. And yeah. he, he, so he's one. Uh, David Goggins is another one. Um, and then Jocko. Uh, I mean, I, I have a bunch. Uh, Cameron Haynes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so those type of guys we absolutely adore. And how does it help us? It just, this is actually a really interesting topic because when I started teaching Bobby is when I started to find these guys. And I have to say it's entirely because that's when I started watching it. I probably started watching YouTube in mass starting and listening to podcasts at the end of 2016. Okay. And around that time, I started to get exposure to these people who, you know, when I was a kid, I used to watch, we used to read Sports Illustrated. So I'd read about Walter Payton, uh, Jerry Rice and people like that. And those guys always fascinated me. And, yeah. you know, I had a huge absence because again, in the media, for whatever reason, they weren't writing about these type of athletes and the work ethic and the, and the simplicity of what they do. And around that time, we started listening to, I don't even know if you know who this guy is, but Gary V um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and some of his videos. And then it, it led to Jocko and then it led to David Goggins. And when, and both me and Bobby started going down this, and that's where the, the by the way, the title of the podcast comes from, because we both go down that road. And it's really, I think it's, so important that your mindset is straight. 
because most people aren't disciplined. I hate to say it. Uh, I'm not, I'm terribly undisciplined, but these guys allow me to stay focused. And they're a constant reminder of staying exactly. You heard my story for 20 years. I sucked at staying on the system. They keep banging into my head, follow the system follow the system, yeah. follow the system. And that's how you get results. Even if it doesn't happen fast, that's one of the things about all these guys. It happens slowly and, and you can't you can't rush for good things to happen. They will if you continue to just, you know, bang away and, and, and fire away at uh, with your discipline. Cool. Bobby? Well, well, I mean, a lot of the guys are, are pretty same, pretty in line. I mean, Steve do listen to a lot of the same content. Um, I mean, in regards to trading, I think it's just, it's trading and it's also in just in life in general. And I think what all of these guys have in common is I think a lot of people look at it as how to be successful. But if you really dig deep into what these guys are saying, it's, it's how to be happy and bulletproof in your life, how to mm-hmm. go through life with no matter what happens, right on. nothing affects you. And you could be smiling from ear to ear, no matter how bad things are around you, or at least, you know, you frown for a little bit and then you pick yourself back up and start going in the right direction. The reason I think that's so important for trading is it's a roller coaster. I think no matter who you are as a trader, whether you're in your first year, your first month, or you've been trading for probably 20 plus, 30 plus, 40 plus years, you know that there's always going to be hiccups. Mark Minervini says it all the time that you're, you're always learning. Even at his level, he's still learning. Yeah. So if you can develop that mind that you can go through all of these ups and downs and just keep pushing forward, keep pushing forward, right. you're, you're going to eventually be able to learn and progress. And the discipline part of everything else really does tie into it. Like Steve said, it's uh, how many things that we just say before about just being undisciplined or that causing huge drawdowns. So it, it all ties in really, really big. I think it's one of the least talked about in a lot of uh, people's shows. I know you yeah. talk about it. I know uh, Mike also, who you were just on talks about Mike, it, Mike. but I think it's probably the most important. Yeah. Now you guys really, you said you live close to Mike. Yeah. So Mike lives in the town, I believe Massapequa or Massapequa Park. Um, Steve lives in Deer Park. I live in Comac. So we're, we're less than 30 minutes from him. Wow. So that's cool. Yeah. One of my, one of my uh, uh, best friends from flight school actually lived, in Long, lived on Long Island also. He may, you know, he may still live there. He was actually a, a, a commodity trader, a uh, um, hedge fund guy in the Twin Towers really? on when it was attacked because he was an old F-4 uh, aviator, F-4 pilot. When they hit above him, that, that, undis- that, that uh, you never forget the smell of jet fuel, never. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, he, he said he started smelling that, and as soon as he started smelling that, he, he ushered his, the people who were working for him to the stairs and down they went. They got out safely and all that kind of stuff, which I'm very thankful for. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and so really something, something you know, just amazing. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys here, Shirley, I'm going to ask you to uh, walk me through the routine that you utilize to find a stock to, uh, and then two, uh, when did it click into you that it's the process is more important than making money, making money is important, but it's it, when did it click into you that being a master of the process is actually the outcome of being the master of the process is generating the, the income, but, but it's the, 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 the outcome, not the primary thing. So uh, you want us to start with our routines or start with that? Well, how about you? Yeah. How about, um, so we don't forget because I can piece this together a little bit later, but on, on when, when did it, the money become less important? Cause I think almost everybody who comes into trading, one of the things that attracts them to that they think it's going to be easy money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go Steve. I'm going to answer that. Be fast, but don't hurry. Mm. John Wooden. After reading the Wooden book, that I'm telling you to put, and, and Bobby never had to worry about this because he heard me constantly hit him over the head because he had read the book before he started trading. So he never had that problem. That's why I'm answering the question for him well, pretty much. Well, you know what it is but, too? But, yeah. Go ahead, finish, finish, yeah. Finish. But uh, yeah, that's, that it was so influential on me that that, you know, hearing it from an outside source 
was amazing. Um, but that's truly where it clicked. And that's why all these other guys are reinforcing what Wooden uh, says. You go, Bob. Um, so one of the first things I think kind of prevented me from feeling like that worry so much about the money was the money I was trading with in my head when I first started was I'm, I'm probably going to screw up and lose this anyway. So in my head, this was like my learning money. So I wasn't concerned about turning into these big profits. I was really just concerned about money, uh, uh, learning, not the money. Um, and then for me personally, I think a lot of just stuff that's gone on in my life, uh, has kind of made me worry more about the process and knowing that the outcome is going to come. Um, I played football in high school and believe it or not, I was a left guard starting left guard, uh, for my high school. I was a little bit bigger then, but I, I always was like in football, like nobody expected me to start. Nobody expected me to play well, but my coaches just always drilled in my head, show up to weight room, show up to practice. Every, anytime I slacked, one of the coaches, um, the head coach had a lot of confidence in me, always pulled me aside. And he's like, if you want to play on this team, you need to put every ounce in every wow. single play during practice. And because I saw that work kind of turn into me starting in football and uh, Steve knows that I do triathlons. I did my first half Ironman, which was also my first triathlon with only eight weeks of training. And I couldn't even swim two laps in the pool. And that was another just example of like, I just stuck to doing every single workout and it led to me completing the race. So I had so many think life experiences outside of trading that told me worry about the process, worry about the little things, not the big picture. It'll come if you do the work Mm -hmm. that uh, it kind of led me down, led me to just start trading, knowing that. Cool. One piece I left out on Wooden, if you don't mind this saying this, John Wooden never talked about winning. He always talked about doing your best, the best you possibly can, could. And if, sure. and if your opponent played better than you, as long as you tried your best, you won. Yeah. And that, that's exactly to me, just the, the perfect example of, you know, if you do the process well and you end up getting a 7% loss, that's the game. Yep. You know, and just go into the next trade and try to try again your hardest. Yeah. I mean, if you if, don't yeah. quit. If you're, you know, you, you know, I, I grade my trades, right? A, B, C, D, you know, type of thing. If I, and my grade never takes into consideration losing or winning. That's awesome. It, it, it takes into consideration how well did I trade my system? Now, if I, if, now I will grade myself down if I lost money unnecessarily by, you know, if I don't follow my stop loss rules, and I blow out 10%. Yeah, that's, you know, that's not, not, that's no bueno. But, but uh, the thing about it is, that's one of the things, you know, Steve, I want to share with you something that Bobby shared in his write up about himself, which was really good. And I, I don't know if you guys, did you know each other before you went to air traffic control school? Yes. Okay. He, he gives you credit, I think, I and mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting what was said here. But you'd already started helping him with the mind mindset things and kind of being a mentor by you know, being a coach. That some of the th- that the things that he came away with actually enabled him to do well at school, do well at air traffic controller school. And it was it was due to your speaking into him, if you will. And so I, I uh, you know, that's that's awesome. And that's one of the other things I find with traders who are doing well, who are being successful with their process, is that they're not afraid to learn new habits and let, and that there is an overflow into the other areas of life. At least you, you better see it that way, because if it doesn't, oftentimes people let their other bad habits in life influence their trading. So he's got a story for you. What did I tell you when you first started trading? In terms of what? How this is going <laughs> to affect, how, gonna affect it, how you view the world. Oh, yeah. I, actually, I'll never forget that. It was when you handed me how to make money in stocks. We were in a supermarket parking lot. And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm passing by there. You can just run over there. I'll hand you the book. We pull into the parking lot. You hand me the book. And you're like, look, I'm warning you. I'm like, what? I'm warning you. 
This book is going to make you see the world completely differently. It's going to change your opinion of a lot of people. Stocks changes your complete perspective on life. I am just warning you that you're going to look at some people differently and you're going to look at life differently. And at the time I like grabbed the book and honestly, I thought Steve was crazy. Um, <laughs> you thought that anyway. But it's a hundred, it was a hundred percent true. hundred percent true. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's uh, go ahead. Now I'm going to ask the guys, you know, please walk us through your selection process. I'm going to go, I've asked uh, Steve and Bobby to go through how they select the stock. And so uh, just keep it step by step, how many steps you go through and all that kind of stuff. I'd really appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm a subscriber to MarketSmith. That's where probably I do 95% of my stock work. Uh, ironically, open stock ideas is pretty uh, easy. Just click on it. Um, I focus really on the IBD list that they give to you because I know, uh, Dennis, you had actually mentioned this. They do a lot of the work for you. There's so many stocks out there. They narrow it down for you and make your job a lot easier. So mm -hmm. why try to reinvent the wheel? The list that I predominantly focus on, uh, Mark Smith Growth 250 is the biggest one. That's where I spend probably the most of my time. The IBD 50 index, as well as, uh, actually wrote some of those down, the uh, New America list, up on volume, the top IPOs and Big Cap 20. And what I'll do is I'll just open up the lists and I actually have, my own layout that I use that brings up all of the different canceling criteria. And I will essentially sort all these stocks, whether it's by composite rating, sometimes I'll change it up and, and depending on what I'm looking for specifically, depending on what's going in the market, sometimes I'll use RS and I will just start from stock number one and just continue Actually, I do start with the weekly charts and I'll continue to just kind of filter through all of these stocks. And what I'm really looking for is mostly the composite rating, EPS and sales. That's like the first things that I look at when I'm doing like kind of quickly going through all right. of these stocks, because I mean, there, as you guys can see, there's just so much on the screen. So I could sit here and probably spend close to 10 minutes on each stock, but in, in the kind of, uh, I guess to just kind of get through these stocks as, as efficiently as possible, that's where I kind of stay focused. So I'll go through each of these stocks and I have what you guys can see up here, a bunch of watch lists. This would be like my major watch list. I would, if I see something that just piques my interest, it goes into that major watch list. Then once I go through all of those IBD lists, then I focus in on just that major watch list. And depending on the type of market, it could be anywhere from 40, 50 stocks to maybe I try to keep it under uh, 100 to 150 stocks. Then I'll narrow that down based on the chart, uh, based on more of the fundamentals until I can keep narrowing it down till I get to anywhere between five to the most I really like to look is 20, which I call like my spotlight list. And that's what I'm focusing on looking into the week, potential yeah. buys for the week. Uh, Steve, is there anything that you want to show in MarketSmith? No, actually, my I do a completely different routine. But I know we do I have a very different routine. Uh, Dennis is going to like my routine better because it's a little bit more IBD old old school. You ready? Are you done or? Yeah. Do you want me to go over to? No, no, I, I'm I'm fine. I, well, actually, if you want to do that, that's perfect. Okay. So I start out. Uh, I print out up on volume. Okay. Oh, real quick, uh, I just wanted to state that. So that's my weekend routine. That's your so I'm not doing that every day. That's just over the weekend. Okay. okay. Cool. This I do this every day. Um, I start out with up on volume. I print that out. Then I print out uh, the new highs. I go through that every single day. That's yeah. a that's an old school trick, right, Dennis? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, twice a week I'll print out RS at new highs because it seems to be not as consistent, uh, consistently updated. And then. On, on MarketSmith, I will look through um, the RS, what is it, the RS dot, um, R, RS blue line dot. So I'll look through that. Um, I will look at, um, and then I'll, then I'll also, uh, what's that? Um, oh, then I'll hit breaking uh, breakout uh, on the daily chart on uh, MarketSmith. Okay. Breaking out today. 
I'll look at near pivots and that is it. And then I have a master list of true market leaders. And okay. there's probably about 40 stocks on that. So then it's not really true market leaders, but it's close enough um, that I'll go through. And those are like the stocks that I have the highest conviction in. And then I keep a list of probably another hundred stocks that, that have piqued my interest. And I go through those as well. Okay. So and I do it all manually, unfortunately. <laughs> so you do it all manually. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I use kind of a, I do, I do not use MarketSmith uh, because I, I utilize, but I still look at all 14 premium lists every Friday. As soon as they right. update the list, I roll those into a big master spreadsheet and I do some, some, some magic with it. And at the end of that, it spits up anywhere from uh, the max I usually have is about 20. The, the least I have is typically about 14. That's my that's my my list for the week. So, but the, so then okay. So you got so now you've got Bob. So Steve, you've got a, maybe a hundred stocks, but then you hone that down to uh, less than how many? I'll show weekly. you. Yep. Oh, it's not weekly. It's like daily. Um, hold on a second. Then I consolidate down into a list. It's a, a master, I don't know if you can see that, a list that every day that I have like an actionable item list. Okay. So you could see that it's uh, yellow up top. Right. That's telling me that the, we were in uptrend under pressure. It has the distribution days. So I know exactly where we're at. And then I rate, rate all these stocks by composite rating and uh, relative strength. And it just gives me, the reason why I do this, it's actually pretty interesting. <laughs> I probably started doing this a couple of years ago. And when I just put the stocks on the list, I realized that the stocks that were doing the best were the ones with the highest relative strength in uh, composite rating. It was, right. it was, it wasn't even close. It was remarkable. It's been one of the big, 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 big changes for me where I would like try to invoke my fundamental analysis and thinking that I knew better and the more I started seeing these stocks, it's almost right. I'll tell you, Beyond Tech is at the top of my list, and it, okay. it ripped today. It's been there for like two or three days. What's what's the uh, ticker? BNTX. So it's BNTX. I just wrote it up, uh, Dennis. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, BNTX. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, it, it's it's amazing how just those two. Yeah. Um, that's pretty. Yeah. How those two, two, uh, ratings are so powerful. Yeah. It seems like lately that the EPS rating was, it's important. Don't get me wrong, but it seems to be a little less important, but it's also compiled in the composite rating. Okay. That no, no good looking chart. Let's see what kind of volume we're doing on this, uh, daily volume, uh, 50 day moving out, 50 day moving average, about 2.5 mil. So I like yeah. that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yes, pretty. And, and full, wait, full disclosure, I bought that today. <laughs> <laughs> pretty bad. Well, see, you know the, you know, uh, Steve, you know, in all full disclosure, I'm a pullback trader, right? Okay. So I'm looking at I, I, um, I have never done well with breakouts, but I love pullbacks. Right. And it's okay. I mean, you know, because I understand the technical technical analysis of the pullback, looking for you know levels of support and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm, uh, I, uh, I loved it when IBD came out with their kind of okay alternative entries. Yeah. Because I'm an alternative entry kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not awesome. So now, so you've got your list. How many entities are you invested in at one time? Bill O'Neill suggests you should never be in more than seven to 12, depending on, or, you know, somewhere around that ballpark, even if you have up to two or $3 million worth uh, 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 of capital invest, how, you know, is that a rule that you follow or do you invest in more or less? Slightly more. Okay. So what's, what's your average? Average. Uh, oh, I have 13 accounts I manage. So it, it's, it depends on which accounts. Okay. So, so I, like, uh, all right, I have, uh, for myself, I have three accounts. 
I probably own seven stocks. Okay. So then, yeah, that's a, that's that's a good number. Yeah. Yeah. Nice I'm, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Bobby. Oh, I was just gonna say I'm. I have two accounts, and I'm probably anywhere between four to six in each account. Okay. And then if I have something that I think is like a true market leader that I have a lot of confidence in, I'll buy them in both accounts. So the amount of stocks I'm actually tracking anywhere from four to probably the max is maybe eight. Okay. Because, you know, I find that uh, if you're going to do the appropriate, uh, you know, portfolio management, it takes time to yeah. do that. And, and a lot of people don't realize that, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, and so being, it's not being under invested. I don't think, because if you look at Bill O'Neill's story, which I absolutely love about it, is, you know, when he first started, he had that 5,000 bucks he used, you know, that he borrowed, you know, and saved, uh, used margin on it. By the end of the year, uh, you know, he only bought like three or four different stocks on the way up. And by the end of the year, I think he was only invested in two, right. but he was, I mean, not only on full margin, he was on, you know, margin on steroids, if you will, because yeah. I mean, he turned that $5,000 into $250,000. Yeah. Back when... I mean, even before you and me got started, Steve, I mean, when you were, he was paying hundreds of dollars for transaction fees. Yep. And, but it was good all without margin. So cool. So I remember, I remember when a discount broker was $105. Yeah. You remember that? I think the yep. most I ever paid for a, a trade, I think was $7.95 was the and most. Then, then, I think it was, <laughs> okay. I yeah, just be quiet. No. <laughs> yeah, I think when it, when it dropped below 50 bucks, I was like beside myself. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, when it went to 1999, I thought, <gasps> <Yep>. <gasps> you know, one of the other things you can probably still remember, also, Steve. I don't know if you used it back in the day, but charting software wasn't part of the platform. There was no platform with the brokerage, and so I had my own charting software that I bought, uh, and I can't remember what it was, but it allowed me to to track, I think, 20 to 50 stocks but I had to download the data daily and I could only go back a certain amount of time for a, for a certain dollar amount. So I'd have the charts to look at, but I had to download them utilizing the old dial-up modem. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. And, yeah. and it would take, you know, sometimes, well, if I could keep the connection going, it would take usually about an hour, hour and a half to download my data yep. and then do the, the investigation. So what uh, what's a couple of stocks that you guys now I'm not asking for a, a a a pick but like what's on your radar right now just one each of a Yontek. stock <laughs> what's that oh, I said I gave you one Biotech I um, for me right now I'm uh, Shopify Shopify you yeah. want to throw that up Bobby on on your chart we're still looking at yep your, absolutely please. Maybe after okay. daily, and then you also got the weekly here too. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, for for myself, DocuSign is probably the highest on. I, I full disclosure, I actually uh, did buy a little bit. I do own a little bit of stock. I own, yeah. yeah, I'm both too. I own Docu, Shopify. And yeah, DocuSign. DocuSign. We made some really good money on that last year with DocuSign. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I missed it when it. Uh, I misinterpreted it when it fell, but now it's breaking back out. So. Um, one of the complaints or one of the criticisms a lot of people make about the, the, the can slam and IBD method and the IBD 50 is stocks only come on, on the list after it is already extended. What do you tell people who have that as a complaint? Well, I think Maybe when you first start, you might be looking at some of these stocks and saying, oh, it's too late. Uh, it's already passed. But the whole key to your watch list is like DocuSign is a perfect example. It's, it's a company that I've been following now for over a year. Right. You may miss that first breakout, but if you do the work, pay attention to the stocks, there's going to be other bases that form, other breakouts that form. And it's just, you, you kind of got to, be continually doing the work. It's funny, me and Steve had talked about this on our show that when you first start to trade, you only know a handful of companies, like some of the bigger names. You don't know right. a lot of companies. And as you start to progress in trading, as you start to do your routine every single day, every single weekend, 
you get exposed to all these stocks and you start to build this kind of internal database of companies. I used to laugh when me and Steve would go to uh, Texas Roadhouse for our meetings. I'd be like, oh, like giddy. Oh, I got this stock. Like, Steve doesn't know about it. I'd be like, hey, Steve, you ever hear of this stock? And he'd like know a lot about it. I'm like, how does this guy know so much? And it was just his experience. And now I've seen that after doing this every single day for over four years now, I have friends who will be like, hey, you ever hear this stock? And I, it's, I know the ticker and everything right off the top of my head yeah. just from the repetitive work. So I think a lot of it, it comes exposure to the market and keeping track of these good, true market leading type of companies. Yeah, yeah. I think it's kind of fun to watch traders talk about this kind of stuff. Kind of like watching aviators talk when they they, they, they basically talk with their hands or flying. Oh, oh, like I'm that. a Long Island Italian guy, so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and traders talk in, in acronyms. Um, mm. I mean, remember back, back in the day when, uh, what was it, ice, it was potash, but it was pot, yes, ice, pot, pot yes. all that kind of stuff. And you'd be talking about this, pe- and people on the streets would look at you like, wow, what are you talking about, man? True. What do you mean you, you made a lot of money trading pot? You know, it's just, yeah. it was crazy. But we talk in acronyms that are ticker symbols, right? Yep. So, 100%. You know, and so what about you, Steve? I forgot what the question was now. Uh, your, what was the question? Uh, when uh, people complain about oh. IBD show stocks when they're extended already. I didn't realize my complaints from software after I sold software tool, tool works were still on the internet. <laughs> 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 um, it's, it's my software tool works ex- example. There's going to be another stock. That's it. You know, just yeah. be patient. That one may have gotten away. You can't kiss all the babies. Go find the next stock. 100%. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I like to, to show people, is that typically stocks go in 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 a rhythm, and typically it's somewhere between a seven and ten day rhythm. And and the fact of the matter, if it's at it, it's high, it's extended away from the mean, it will revert to the mean. And so I wonder how many people have lost money unnecessarily because they said the heck with waiting for the pullback or waiting for a good breakout or whatever, and they just buy it willy nilly without having a trigger. So I have that, the answer. Almost everybody. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah. so, so, okay. Now that you've had me, the last question I'm going to ask you guys is you have your list, Steve, you showed a, your, your list uh, of, of potential candidates and we know how many stocks you like to invest in. And it's going to be a two part question is when do you fire a position that is that you're already long in and what is your trigger to get into a new, a new position? What's your trigger? You know, and this is for both of you guys. Uh, I guess I'll go first. So for selling a position I'm already long in, I have actually gotten very, very good in probably the past year of, I have an Excel sheet of classifying the type of stock, whether it's, something more of a swing trade, whether it's a strict trade or whether this is like a longer term true market leader type of stock that okay. I have a position in. And each one of those tabs has a separate set of rules for all phases. I have uh, what I call the red rules, which are kind of selling for losses and the different rules that I can apply to that. I have, uh, I call it the no man's land rules for a cancel trader. That's like zero to like that 10%, right. um, zero to 20% where you're like, you haven't hit that kind of profit goal. Uh, how I handle a stock if it starts reversing or or whatever it may be around those periods. So I have everything kind of pre-written out. And this is where the daily routine comes in, sitting down, looking at my portfolio and saying, okay, what stocks do I own? Where are they at? What's my gain at right now? And where are my stops? And that goes on both the upside and on the downside. And okay. I this is actually the one thing I do Steve's way. And I, I will hand write out in my notebook uh, what my plan is for all of my stocks the percentage I'm willing, I'm going to sell if it hits those stops. And then uh, I'll set the alerts. I am lucky that with air traffic control, uh, as much as when you're on the scope, you're on the scope, you can't really look at your phone, but when you get up, you get all, you know, there's a lot of on and off and breaks. Right. I have the ability to normally not be too far away from the market or at least an alert um, for more than kind of two hours. So that's what I do on the, for selling of the stock. And for buying of stock, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. I have my, my rules. I narrow that list down that I call the spotlight list. Um, 
I will normally take that spotlight list and then kind of have like my top tier, my middle tier, my bottom tier, and then I'll kind of set alerts on all of those buy points. And part of my weekend routine is really picking the stocks that, all right, if this stock breaks out, I want to buy it. If this stock breaks out, I want to buy it. And then yeah. all the other alerts are just kind of a, okay, you know what, at the end of the day, you should really look into the stock and see what's going on. And, and, and if maybe you need to reassess why you weren't willing to pull the trigger right away. So okay. it really, what it comes down to, it's all pre-planning. Okay. So um, do you use any conditional orders whatsoever on, on getting in or getting out? Or are you strictly off of the alerts? Um, if there's something that I really like do not want to miss and I think might have like a big move or, or something along those lines, I'll put, um, I'll put like a, an order, you know, if it breaks this price, get me in. Uh, okay. but for the most part, uh, I kind of work off alerts. I'm okay. lucky. I am, like I said, I'm lucky enough to have the ability to kind of be able to trade a little bit here and there. Plus I do work a lot of night shifts. So sometimes I'm actually sitting at home and I can yeah. be in front of my laptop as well. Yeah. What about you, Steve? My methodology is pretty straightforward and simple. As you can see, I pre-planned the night before. So I have only two alternatives. If a stock is hitting my sell rule, I'll sell mm -hmm. it then. If not the night before, if I have an underperformer and a laggard, I know that day I'm getting out of it. And part of the reason why I, I don't really need alerts or anything like that. I, I work in front of a desk all day. So I have two screens and my iPad. My iPad is where I keep most of my stock stuff. So I'm pretty well aware of everything that's going on in my portfolio during the day. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy for me to do that. But th those, that's really how I'm getting in and rolling into other stocks. So like an example, this week when the market got hit, I sold a couple of the underperformers and I put that, that money into work into stocks I already owned, which were DocuSign and Shopify. That's a great point. That's a great point. So you're feeding your winners. That's yes. <clears throat> yes, I love exactly. It. So, okay. Hey, Bobby, if you want to stop sharing. Absolutely. I mean, I want you to continue sharing. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, the last thing, and I'll just throw it to, throw it to you guys. Okay, you're doing this wonderful website or YouTube channel. Um, just, you know, as, I, as we, I, we wrap up this recording, you know, what do you want to tell other people who are out there watching, you know, well, one, why should they come watch you? And two, what are you, what are you uh, attempting to do with your uh, YouTube channel uh, for the uh, disciplined mind trader? This, I mean, honestly, this started out as almost like a trading journal because because of COVID, Steve and I stopped doing our meetings in person and started doing our meetings through Zoom. We had friends that were trying to jump in. The calls just got pretty extended. And then we just said, you know what, let's record it. And then Steve had the idea of saying, let's just throw it on YouTube. We'll always have the ability to go back and see what our thoughts were on the market for that week. Right on. And I kind of got uh, some enjoyment out of the production part of it. And it, it kind of just grew from there. But it's one of those things where I, I, I said for me before in the beginning, Steve's help completely expedited my trading learning. And I think that number one, we want to do that for other people. We want to be able to kind of have this community and a place to go where people can be listening to content that goes in line with what they're trying to accomplish in terms of trading. Uh -huh. And selfishly, it helps us a lot. Uh, doing this every single week, it holds us accountable, number one, because if we're going to go on there and I'm going to start breaking down the NASDAQ and what's going on in the chart, I can't just flip the screen on and, and just start talking. I mean, I have to do the work. I have to plan. I have to take my notes and really have a grasp of what's going on in the market. So it holds us accountable. And the questions that we get from our viewers completely push us to look at things in a completely different perspective. There are questions that I don't think I would have ever have thought of and somebody X and maybe I'm just doing it in like kind of like second nature. And then it makes you think of that process in your head, break it down and then speak what you're saying. So it, it helps us a lot too. But I, I think to kind of sum up for me, at least, I just hope that we can change somebody's life and have the ability to maybe somebody that was struggling in trading, maybe somebody that was hesitant in training trading 
and help them along a process that they can kind of financially change their life and just overall change their life. Cool. Steve? Yeah, I agree. Number one, I, I, I want our podcast to be fun. Uh, yeah. You can tell we're, we're, too, we're, we're really not too uh, <laughs> rigid guys, but uh, so that, that's it. The trading can be fun. I think it's when you win at something, it's fun. And that I'll tie this together with what, it, what it's about. It's about, it's a journey. And part of what, as Bobby said, that this germinated out of our Texas Roadhouse routine, that this is a routine. You have to consistently do this. And if you consistently, you know, join us each week, each, each week, yeah, it's repetitive. I'm not going to lie, but it's going to guide you because, again, as repetitive as, as it is, you know, we give some proprietary information. We have our, our, our proprietary pizza score on there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, it, it gets you prepared for the week ahead. And that, you know, Bobby said it best. Anyone can do this. You don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a finance accounting guy. You could, right. you know, just be the kid uh, who needed a math tutor and yeah, uh, barely it, got through the math. Uh. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and just to have fun and, and, and to understand that like anything else in life, this takes discipline and it's right. just not going to come to you. Ready? And this is probably the biggest thing. I understand how people buy and hold and certain people get lucky, but that, when you hear all the, the misconceptions out there, they're not necessarily true and that there's plans and strategies that actually work. You can actually time the market. That's a huge thing about canceling. You absolutely can. And right it's, right it's not as scary as you think it is. If you just delve down, it, it's not that scary because if two, two knuckleheads from Long Island could do this, who talk about pizza and, and, and other stuff, you know, anyone could do this because there are so many people that are smarter than me. That's the other thing I realized. We have a Discord channel. I can't tell you how many smart people are on there. It's like, I feel like an idiot when I go on there. Okay. So um, you mentioned Discord. Uh, I will put down, when I get this all done, I'll get you guys' Discord channel and I'll put that in the comments on the YouTube yep. channel. And, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, so I'm very, thank you both for oh, thank you, joining Dennis. me today. Uh, thank you. This is awesome. And uh, I really love, you know, one, I, I just, like I said, I, I felt connected to you guys almost from the first time I, you know, listened to you, you know, what you were sharing, what you were talking about. I felt there was a connection there. <clears throat> I would like to invite you, okay, because you guys are, you guys are closer to, you are basically more can slim purist than I am. And that's okay. That, that's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing about it is, is with my, my Investor Business Daily Meetup group, we meet twice a month, first Tuesday and the third Tuesday, every month, uh, five, no, six, yeah, 6.30 Pacific time. I realize that's a little bit late on the East Coast for you guys. No, it's like 9.30, something. Yeah, it's not too yeah, late. But I would really like to invite you guys. As a matter of fact, I, could, I can slide the time up a little bit if you want. But I would like to invite you to come and and present an hour and a half's worth about Can Slim, your process. You're just basically just be yourselves. Because the one is it's important to be be ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and and not in the but to the Bay Area Money Makers group. And I'll I'll throw you throw out um, you know sometimes when and then you guys can pick and choose where you would like to go. I, I would really love to have you come and do that. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. hundred yeah. percent. And yeah, I, we're flexible with time. Like I said, I'm, I mean, I work all weird hours and weird shifts. So for me, time doesn't really matter. I, I'll, I'll make the time and. Okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It sounds awesome. So, you guys got any questions for me? I think, I, th I think I'm talked out. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis got a taste yeah. of what I do with on a like regular, uh, a weekly basis. <laughs> yeah. Dennis, if you ever want just me alone, that's fine. I, we don't need that Bobby here either. <laughs> Uh, no, this is good. This is a lot of fun. This yeah, is really, it really great. was fun. Where tool works too soon, but uh, anyway, hey guys, thank you so much. Uh, look forward to making connections continue, and uh, just God bless you both. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and and Dennis, uh, the invites always open on our podcast as well. Uh, I was actually talking to Steve before, and I just said, you know, obviously uh, for yourself, you know, you're going to get content out with us now. 
So I don't know, whenever you feel it, it's best for you guys to come on our show and, and talk about what you guys do. I know our community would be really, really uh, interested in a lot of the stuff that you talk okay. about. Absolutely. The door is always open. The, and, and I'm just a terrible, I'm not, well, I'd love to ask questions. One, do you, do you have a yearly targeted return that you're looking for on a yearly basis? Like you mentioned, you beat the S&P or you beat the markets last year. But I mean, last year was a, last year was a almost, you know, uh, just throw your money in the wall. And it's going to make yeah. money. <laughs> this year has been a little bit tougher. I know that I'm, I'm being challenged, but, but what, what is some of your, what's your objective? You know, 10%, 20%, 30%. Uh, I think means you're probably gonna say the same thing. I'm gonna, it's beat the market, okay. S well, and P and, well, and this year, Michael, S and P and the Nasdaq. You know this. I want to double the S and P for sure yes. this year. Yeah. So, so the S and well, yeah, double and the S and P right now is up what 16 percent or so for the year. So yeah. yeah. So well, they say that you know good trend following systems and and can't slam is a trend following system. You know, uh, and I it, it basically. You're looking somewhere between thirty to forty percent as a yeah. as a fairly routine thing without you know just busting your butt to you know uh, killing yourself. So, okay, that answers my question, guys. Thank you so much. God thank bless. You. Again, thank you, Dennis.